thanks for making it to today's talk last day after lunch so thanks um, i uh, in this talk i would be um, sharing a story with you about my experience and my team's experience on writing kubernetes operator what were the challenges that we faced and how we uh, overcome it so the content of this talk would look something like this um, i'll be sharing the problem context uh, where we started off with what were the um, alternative solutions apart from Q writing kubernetes operator for us how they did not work for us and how we transitioned into writing a kubernetes operator uh, this was just the half story of finding the right kind of solution for us but the technical challenges started coming after uh, we um, started implementing the operator and making it productionized uh, we would also go ahead uh, and see like what are the good resources that are already available uh, which you can look into if you want some additional uh, resource uh, resources or you are just starting out in the space um, apart from that we will uh, do the recap of what we looked uh, what we will look today and any questions that you guys have uh, feel free to stop me in between if you have some questions and something is not clear so yeah let's understand what kind of application uh, i and my team were working on um, the application would process lots of messages in a day and it would be of multiple kinds right i cannot go into the details or architecture of the application but uh, you can um, understand something like uh, a message processor right and it could process the events ranging from a simple otp message to some email content that the marketing team would use right and once these messages would be processed these would be uh, sent to uh, different business applications so application who wants to send the marketing uh, content right or wants to uh, uh, process uh, the uh, uh, credit card transactional statements so such kind of applications would consume uh, these events based on category and configuration so maybe an uh, transactional statement would want to read a message Uh, immediately and even if the communication between the uh, between my application and that business application fails they want it to be retried immediately uh, for 10 times right but that might not be the case with uh, notifications uh, team uh, who wants to read marketing messages and all right now uh, these configurations that we would manage uh in throughout the presentation i would refer to as states so there were around 15 to 20 such fields would uh, which would contribute to a state and we were managing it in a centralized way so one team would manage all these states right and these states would be actually uh, replicated in multiple zones for multiple tenants so uh, only my testing zone would have like somewhere around 5 to 10 tenants which would be go, uh, growing based on the business needs right now uh, mainly we say that a team would be managing it but behind the scenes there was a sre who would manage it and our sre is anand anand would on a day apart from handling incidents and uh, uh, other issues he would just manage 15 to 20 tickets on good days and on bad days he would like take 50 plus tickets at night if there is any specific uh, requirement from the business application right so the state of the entire uh, operations was not was not super good and uh, anand was stressed out we needed a solution which could help out anand uh uh lessen his burden uh which would ensure that security is not compromised which would help us move from the centralized solution uh to a decentralized solution and hopefully uh, it could be done in an automated way right um so these were the solutions that we tried 
we thought okay maybe giving a helping hand to anand would help us out but given i as i mentioned earlier that uh, transferring the knowledge of uh, what our application was doing was uh, pretty complex and the time we invested in training a new uh, resource was not uh, was not yielding a satisfactory result right so we thought maybe okay we can tr uh, try out some automated solutions uh, we tried to build a jenkins pipeline and a ui which could uh, just decentralize it and we could just give it to uh, the business uh, application owners that you have your parameters manage them and we don't want to like uh, uh, do that repetitive task for you right but that that led to uh, issues that we were not able to uh, properly do the authentication and auditing of uh, the resource changes that were happening uh, we had a lot of duplication so what we did were, was to offload the burden from anand to other teams uh, this did not look like a solution that would help us in a long run so that is when we transitioned into writing a kubernetes operator um, i would emphasize here that when we started writing an operator we were not the team who would know a lot about kubernetes or writing the operator and uh, like we just knew that what we wanted to do what were our requirements and how it could roughly be solved with the operator we were trying to manage the states we were doing some repetitive task all along we knew that we could easily convert our problem into a declarative model we researched a bit and found that none of the uh, existing controllers available could solve our problem and the mistake that we made or the inaccurate assumptions that we made were uh, uh, that there wouldn't be much learning curve for us or there wouldn't be uh, much resource overhead which uh, we found out that uh, caused uh, the issue to uh, us later on so uh, like we uh, once we knew okay we are going with the kubernetes operator approach we started out uh, with uh, finalizing what our crds would look like right and uh, like just writing a boilerplate code with those crds uh, or custom resource definitions uh, using the uh, cube builder framework uh, if any one of you is looking to write you can, you guys can choose based like the framework based on your use case and um, uh, uh, feasibility uh, we wrote some uh, basic custom logic and validations uh, based on our use cases and then we tested it in local environments how many of you are aware of what crds or custom resource definitions are okay quite a lot so just in case if someone doesn't know what a crd is uh, it's you can like loosely uh, relate it to uh, something like a contract between your operator and what it would read uh, right so uh, you can specify what kind of uh, fields would be present and what kind of version your crd would use right uh, one of the mistakes we did as a newbie when we were starting out was not understanding the importance and uh, of deciding what our scope would be we were an infrastructure team so we had lots of permission and we started out with the scope of cluster and we didn't realize at the time what security risks it could possess and how it could uh, uh, be a road blocker for us to serve a complete self uh, served solution to our users the second mistake that we uh, made was that we did not uh, maintain the status of our crs which uh, blocked us into understanding uh, the insights of how our crs were performing understand getting the alerts on time and maintaining them right maintaining our application stably so uh, before i move on to uh, what 
the challenges that we encountered during this process. This is how uh, a custom operator might work. I, as a user, might create some YAML file uh, or something similar, which would act as my custom resource. My operator would have a reconciliation loop, which would keep on uh, reading for any of the updates that are happening in this ER and try to make uh, my actual state uh, similar to what the desired state should be, right? And then maybe a verification uh, that we would talk about how to do it in the later slides. So yeah, so like we moved on from phase one where we did a basic setup of our Kubernetes operator to the uh, phase two where we were testing and trying to see if uh, we were able to make some up, uh, updates to our CRs and maybe CRD, right? So we are testing with 5,000 plus CRs in our pre-prod environment which looked much more similar to uh, what my production environment would look like rather than the case was with the local testing. And as I said earlier, we were testing with the scope of cluster. While we were testing it and we uh, reached out to multiple uh, different teams who were using our uh, operator, we realized most of the teams were not having uh, the permission to access the cluster scope CRDs and create, uh, use their CRs properly. Uh, and then we explored, okay, like there were some security risks involved there, right? So we were having no other option than to migrate uh, our uh, CRs and CRD. Uh, for us, this was the case, but for others, the case could be pretty different that Maybe uh, you are not making some state which is backward compatible and you might be forced to migrate, right? And like for us, we were also using uh, Helm and Helm doesn't support any upgrade or deletion of CRD. So we were forced to uh, uh, like execute the steps manually to update our CRDs. Now, uh, this is what we wanted to avoid. We wanted to avoid the cluster uh, going down, and this is what exactly we faced. We faced the split brain problem. So while we were uh, upgrading our CRDs, we later on realized that most of our CRs, which should have been deleted, were not deleted, and the entire cluster just got down due to the state difference that we had. Uh, I have a uh, demo on this, but I don't have it in slides. So if anyone requires it, uh, I can give it offline. So uh, th this was our first lesson that any changes we make after we uh, like uh, go to production, we shouldn't be making any of the migrations as long as possible. And if we are actually uh, planning for migration, uh, it should be like each and every step should be thoroughly uh, thought through, right? Uh, because ultimately you are playing around with uh, the Kubernetes internal system. So uh, try to avoid it. And if you are doing it, just plan it uh, well. Um, apart from that, one mistake, that, uh, mistake we did not realize was that uh, like playing around with the finalizers of custom resources. I would say not just custom resource, don't play around with any of the Kubernetes finalizers you have, right? So we were done with this. We understood, okay, like what we shouldn't be doing. Uh, and we recovered uh, soon from uh, uh, this problem. And then we had our backups in place. So we were good to uh, go to production. Once we got into production, we started having issues related to uh, like how we get the insights and how we make it fully self-served, right? It, uh, the operator was working fine. We had resolved our technical issues. We had validations in place, right? But most of the people were not able to understand how they would move on to the new process, right, of maintaining these states. Now, when I say this, we had a basic documentation in place, 
but we were not having the documentation would, would, which would serve to different personas. And I think having that was the most critical part to making it self-serve. Um, after we had a proper documentation, we moved on from having daily like around 15, 20 tickets to two, three tickets. And it was a great savior for us. Later on, uh, we realized that as people were, um, st people started using this process and as uh, custom resources increased in our uh, cluster, uh, we realized that most of people were complaining. Uh, the state difference was not um, getting reflected on time. And this was because we were not handling concurrency well for uh, different, uh, like for the needs of different zones. So we realized, okay, we should have something which uh, makes it configurable. And with the growing tenants, uh, we should be able to uh, handle it uh, well, right? Uh, we realized it later on as well that because we were not having alerts on time, the issues became uh, critical. And if we had matrix and alerts on what was the requeue size, what was the uh, lag that like each, what was the latency that each of the CR took to get uh, uh, into a reconciled loop would have helped us tremendously. So setting up the observability in the process of maturing your operator would play a big role. Uh, apart from that, we realized that we had high latency. Uh, we resolved the issue of high latency, but that came with the uh, uh, with with uh, us processing lots of CR. Right now, with this, we observed that a couple of downstream applications that we were having uh, were actually uh, not implementing rate limiting uh, 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 up to the mark. And that made uh, those applications go down and uh, created a, a bigger issue for us, right? So uh, if you are having any of the applications which is not able to uh, handle these scenarios well, uh, then make sure that you have configurable uh, concurrency and rate limiting in place. Apart from this, we also um, understood that most of this overload was coming from the stale resources. So stale resources were not only using the resources in our cluster, but also making the entire process slow. So having a systematic uh, approach to cleaning up these resources on time could lead to greater advantages in terms of latency and uh, resource uh, uh, saving. Uh, then we were able to achieve this systematic uh, cleanup uh, observability because we were able to maintain the status of each CR. So make sure that like, Initially, you might not need it, but as you go to the higher zones, you might uh, want to make sure that your state uh, status of your uh, CRs is in place. Uh, and then uh, in the last, we also added end-to-end -end, uh, testing, uh, which helped us uh, like make sure that our entire pipeline was not breaking uh, due to any of the changes that we make in downstream applications. So this is how we achieved uh, the stability of our Kubernetes operator in, um, in all the uh, production zones. And currently we are running this in around like five different production zones we have with each having uh, somewhere around three to five uh, tenants. Uh, what I found useful in this entire journey was were these talks. Uh, why you shouldn't be writing the Kubernetes operator in the first place, avoiding any of the like any of the changes, like first figure out whether it's necessary for you or not. If there are other alternatives, go with it first. Uh, else, like if you don't have, just go through the checklist of uh, 
required whatever would be required in writing a Kubernetes operator. Then a uh, bit on like what CRDs are and how it could be useful for you and how not, why and how not to play with your uh, like uh, finalizers, right? Uh, you can go through them. These are pretty good. Uh, so just recapping through all the uh, things that we went through. Uh, first, explore all the alternatives you have before diving into writing a Kubernetes operator. Try to make as accurate estimations as possible uh, while you uh, plan to write a Kubernetes operator. Uh, make sure that you are making correct uh, considerations when deciding on writing CRDs. Uh, this could be uh, this could create a real uh, big issues if you don't plan it well. Have a thorough documentation for each and every persona you have. M uh, manage the concurrency of your operator uh, properly. Have effective observability before the issues become big. Uh, make sure that you are able to catch them. Do the proper resource cleanup. Uh, and have a systematic approach to it, and make sure that you have end-to-end uh, -end testing in place. Thank you. Um, feel free to uh, like give any feedbacks you have on the slide. <laughs> any questions? <clears throat> Hi, uh, great talk. This is Xudong from University of Illinois. So, uh, I'm not able to hear, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, how about now? Yeah. Oh, better. yeah. Uh, I'm Xudong from University of Illinois. And uh, I'm in particular curious about uh, the split brain uh, problem you mentioned uh, in the talk. Could you elaborate uh, on that a little bit more? How does this happen? What is exactly you know, the split brain here? And how do you address that? Uh, so are you asking that how the split brain problem occurred for us? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so as I mentioned, I was uh, we were actually running our CRDs with a sc scope of cluster, right? Mm -hmm. Now uh, we actually ma manually went and changed all the uh, uh, like required CRDs uh, to the namespace scope, and we were having like in thousands we were having our CR instances which were running with that cluster scope. Uh, uh, Right. So when we moved our CRD, most of our uh, CR instances were not moved to the namespace. So we actually uh, like what was expected or desired result was expecting the scope of cluster, while most of our CRs were running in the namespace scope. Right. And that was the time we made a uh, mistake while we were using finalizer. Right. It did not work uh, as expected and. Um, Due to the state difference, it led to a split brain problem, and actually our entire pre-prod cluster went down. Uh, but yeah, like once we fixed that, we instead of like uh, playing around with the finalizers, we patched the CRs, and then we were working fine. Like we did it for all of our uh, uh, prod zones as well, like few of the activities, and it was working fine. OK, so it's basically because you are trying to change the scope from yeah. cluster to namespace. And yeah, namespace. yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, it's not necessarily that uh, this was the case with us. Like, we were trying to uh, make sure that the state is, uh, like, the scope was migrated. But it could be f with any of the state that you are trying to manage. And it's not backward compatible. So, yeah, like plan. I think what we learned was planning your uh, CRDs well is super helpful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So on the CRDs with Helm uh, slide, we ran into something similar. We have a uh, uh, we have a custom we have several custom CRDs internally that we upgrade uh, regularly. Mm -hmm. And we ran into this uh, attempting to write a Helm chart to deploy our Kube Builder operator. Um, upon some research, it's actually a little misleading. You can upgrade CRDs with Helm, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to not put them in the CRD folder. If mm -hmm. you treat them just like any other manifest, they will apply an upgrade 
just like you would expect. This is the approach that uh, several large operators, uh, cert manager being one of them, follow. You just lose the support for deletion because if you delete your CRD, you delete every CR as well. <laughs> so yeah. you can upgrade, you just have to take the risk of, if I uninstall this, I'm yeah. gonna uninstall everything else. Yeah, so, so. Uh, uh, was it for like Helm 3 or Helm 2 uh, that you explored? I also uh, saw that, but at the time we were using Helm 2, so uh, we had our restrictions there. What was the Helm version I'm asking for you? Like This is recent, so this would be Helm 3. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so yeah I, we, I we were bigger. running Helm 2 and mm. we had our restrictions, so yeah. Yeah, Helm 3, it's standard. Yeah, like they are making some, uh, like they are considering other options going forward with the Helm upgrade. So it should be easier, yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the session, it's helpful. Yeah. So these operators, right, until they run uh, into issues, they are great. Once you hit the mm -hmm. kind of issues, kind of a, you, you get into all sorts of troubles, as I understand. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, one, you mentioned end-to-end -end testing, mm -hmm. right? Could you explain what kind of uh, you know end-to-end -end testing that you have done? And second, how did you handle the the errors, right? Mm -hmm. If it runs successfully, no issues, right? Mm -hmm. When there are errors, yeah. it's hard to debug yeah. or troubleshoot. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll start with the second question that you asked on uh, how to handle errors, right? For us, we figured out three set of uh, scenarios that we would run into. One, so our operator would uh, call external API and based on that, it would uh, like create the states, right? Now for us, the uh, there were three uh, scenarios. One was success, if it runs fine, we are good. The second was that if uh, there is an error, it could be either retriable error or it won't be retriable error, right? If it's not retriable error, we just want to discard it and we want to make sure that the status of what kind of error is maintained. And if we are like, for us, we uh, were okay to retry it 10 times. So. If, so uh, when you write the operator, it has the custom logic of uh, exponential back off. Uh, so like if uh, we wanted to retry them 10 times, if they were uh, successful, then good. Otherwise we won't retry them. So I, I think you can uh, like play around with your uh, retry logic, but yeah, like having that distinction between what is tri retriable and non-retriable is important. And for end-to-end -end testing, uh, so we were actually uh, managing uh, multiple applications at the same time, and few of the, them were getting updated pretty um, quickly, right? So uh, in the end, uh, what happened that while creating the state, we were calling a couple of APIs, right, for uh, authentication and then for state creation. We realized that if we were uh, uh, playing around with those APIs or those contracts, we were actually facing the issue uh, with the operator because once your operator is stable or any application is stable, you don't want to touch it, right? And you tend to forget, forget that uh, something might be causing problem. So because we had alerts in place and we had like lots of uh, uh, traffic, uh, if there would be any failure, right? We would get the alerts uh, uh, pretty quickly. So that is how it helped us uh, like do the testing whenever we made changes in any of the downstream applications. Got it, thank you, helpful. Yeah. Hey, about the uh, split brain. Uh, mm -hmm. So one thing I wanna bring up is um, uh, the way I and we look at CRDs is basically we're extending the API layer of Kubernetes by introducing new domain objects, right? And that's what the definitions are. Wouldn't it be, because, and if you think about it, like those attributes and those contracts are always going to be changing, right? Um, now I know you said try not to change it, but wouldn't it have been a version control on the CRD, something that if you're doing a modification of let's say scope changing, 
well, you could have easily just bumped the version mm -hmm. of the CRD and you're treating it just like an API. It is literally mm -hmm. the API layer, right? Mm -hmm. So the new version of your API is now going to be supported on a namespace scope versus mm -hmm. your previous version is on mm -hmm. a cluster scope. Mm -hmm. And so your controller is now looking at the new mm -hmm. version of the mm -hmm. object on the, via the API, right? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that, that fix maybe the split? So uh, for us, the issue was that we wanted to manage these states, right? So any of the CR instances that we had, right? We wanted to make sure that if we are upgrading it, so either the option was that we patch all the CR instances mm -hmm. that were present mm -hmm. to use the like upgraded CRD version, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we thought like that wasn't a good option for us to go ahead and that is why we had to migrate. So we did consider moving the version, but uh, that was not useful for this use for case. Use case. Um, the other thing is what I'm trying to look at is would there be, because um, what we do like in a normal microservice development, right, is you have a request ID um, for requests, right? Um, normally like a UUID that gets passed on and then you use a context object throughout to know um, how do you correlate that inside your logs, right, for debugging. Um, when it comes to, again, the operators and everything, again, we're going through the Kubernetes APIs, right? So, assumably, if there is a request ID or an ID that's associated with that request, with the CRUD action that's happening against the object, do you know if there is a way we can grab that inside like the reconciliation inside the controller so that we can have that inside the context object um, pass through the execution of business logic and that way we're actually storing it in logs uh, and standard out so that when there's the request comes in on that object, we have an associated correlation ID that we can then track if there is a failure or what whatnot. Uh, does, does that make sense? Uh, I couldn't actually follow it entirely. So is it that you are asking for a particular uh, request? Are we able to follow yes. what are the errors? Yeah. Uh, and this request is actually the CR, right? Is it? Y yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you do the request for like apply, right? Either to create, update, or delete mm -hmm. of a, ob a, a CR object, right? So again, that request is literally an API call that's happening, right? Now through the cube cuddle or what have you, right? <laughs> um, now that's going to come and go inside the controller's reconciliation, right? <laughs> and then gets picked up. And um, do you know if there's like a request ID, if there's an ID of some sort for that request that we can use as a correlation ID in our logs? Because <laughs> when you go inside the reconciliation, right, we're logging. Mm -hmm. what's happening and those are either it's kubernetes logs or it's a log risk that you're using and you're mm -hmm. sending that on to like a centralized logging right mm -hmm. if we have that request we can use it as a correlation so that if anything does happen right inside our central log we can always refer to it i don't know if you guys looked into that or not i'm not pretty sure about the entire like i'm not sure about the question itself uh, well, I, I just wanted to know if there's a request ID mm -hmm. um, that you knew about mm -hmm. that comes down into the reconciliation or not. Uh, yeah, so like uh, the uh, the CR name uh -huh. that were, we were using, that is what we were using to actually search for any of the errors that would come in the logs. So uh, for us at least, that did solve our problem. Okay, it's the, yeah. the name. Okay, the CR yes, name yeah. itself. Would, yeah. And we had the, so the name of uh, what our uh, like state name was, right? Like right. each state had a unique ID as well, right? So uh, the CR name was also similar to it. So we were pretty well uh, able to like actually follow the entire trace of like if it's going into reconciliation loop, uh, how many times it's going into reconciliation loop, and if there are any uh, downstream um, errors that we encounter. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay, thank you.